beginnings of Galva started with a watering hole up there somewhere <laughs> on the No Spring by early settlers. Welcome to the Legion Hut, even though I know it as the place where my granny grew up. Uh, her name was Matilda No, and she drank from the No Spring. This, this piece of land has more to its history. It was a park at one time, and also the settlement of the Shawnee Indians. The No Spring had to be covered and uh, sealed because it became contaminated by either typhoid or cholera. When the Legion Hut was built, you may notice two chimneys on each side. Uh, Matilda knows my grandmother, Mary Charlie Estes, who built the chimneys. So I do have a family connection here. Now, Janice Puffy has more to tell about the construction of the Legion Hut. The Legion Hut was a fort, the American Legion was formed in uh, 1920 after World War I. My grandfather, William Paul McPherson, was one of the members that started it. Uh, there were several that fought in World War I. And then in 1933 is when they started building the building. You can read it, the history of, uh, of the Legion HUD on our Marion County website, but my family's got a little bit more story to it. <laughs> if you read the history, it says the logs were donated. Well, my grandfather, William Paul McPherson, cut and sawed and donated the logs, but got no credit for it. Now, my mother was one of the first women, because she was in World War II, uh, she drove pri German prisoner of war trucks. She was over the motor pool at Fort Chaffee, and she joined the Legion Hut in 1945. So I have her original certificate, but as the years progressed, uh, my mother would say, don't look over there when we'd pass. And I, I said, well, why can't I look over there? Well, Daddy didn't get any recognition for all those logs, and we're not going to look over there. So I think my mother would be sadly disappointed. I have three meetings a month in this building. <laughs> but the building has, has been a, a very big blessing to us, and uh, the Estes name was from a boy that was killed that lived in Summit in, 19, in the war in 1918. And then uh, Mr. Williams was born, uh, died at Pearl Harbor, so they added his name after that. So it, it's been a wonderful blessing to be built right here on this land, on the no land. Well, hello everyone. <clears throat> I'm McCoy and this here is Bill. Welcome to No Spring. This spring was actually named after a family whose descendants still reside in Marion County today. Unfortunately, no spring is no longer a spring, but it once furnished a good, clean water supply. In a book I once read, an early day writer wrote, a traveler crossed the White River at the mouth of Crooked Creek and ascended that stream for many miles. About 20 miles from the mouth, he came to an Indian village occupied by about 300 Shawnees, probably attracted to the spot by the cane for the cattle and horses to feed in the winter. They settled here where no spring ran for decades. They used the clean water from this spring for cooking, bathing, and drinking. Their presence led to this area being called Shawnee Town, later named Yaleville. These Shawnee Indians had some interesting ways, to say the least. They were a lively bunch for sure. The white settlers liked to visit from far and near. For one thing, the Shawnee built several small huts mostly made of cedar logs. They covered these with boards six feet long and about two courses to the side, notching their logs on the top rather than the bottom like we did. Guess it worked better for them. Hey Bill, do you remember the green corn dances which would occur each year during roasting year time at Shawnee Town? I sure do. How could I ever forget? The Shawnee would make a ring about 150 feet in circumference and clean the ground off real nice. Similar to an old fashioned wheat yard where the settlers like to tromp their wheat out on horses. When all the arrangements were complete, the performance began. It was a lot of fun to watch. Hard to take your eyes off. One of the Indians would beat a drum made from a log hollowed out until the walls were thin and cover the ends with a dry hide. When the drum would beat, the Indians would dance and half march around the circle once, then turn around and go back the other way. As they did so, they would sing or 
chant, and they would have their leggings filled loosely with small pebbles and mussel shells that rattled around as they danced and hopped around the circle. They would not dance long before they stopped and filled their pipes fixing their tomahawk with tobacco or substitute if they did not have tobacco. After lighting their pipe, they would take a puff and pass it around until each Indian got a draw from each pipe. Then they would rise and go on with the dance. This was repeated several times before they became weary of their work. You know, I remember a story Alan Trimble once told me. He witnessed a green corn dance at Shawneetown when one of the Indians became beastly drunk and became unruly and boisterous. Some of the Indians tried to quiet him, but it was impossible to do so. After enduring his recklessness for as long as they could, they quit dancing long enough to tie his hands and feet together with a buckskin thong like tying a hog. Then they dumped him into the shade of a tree where he remained until he was sober enough to behave himself. <laughs> That's a funny story, McCoy. However, the fate of the Shawnees was not. These natives were forced out of the area in 1834 and relocated in Oklahoma on a journey known as the Trail of Tears. Eventually, no springs waters became tainted and polluted. All that drank from it became sick with cholera. No spring was promptly plugged so no others would fall ill. Shawnee Town, though, survived and was later renamed Yaleville, the county seat of Marion County. We've enjoyed sharing with you and hope you have a nice evening. We just picked one of the book that we thought would be a really good one for y'all to see. On July 4th, 1849, Jesse Mooney, who was the sheriff, deputized several men, making plans to clean up the county. In the meantime, the Tut faction was gathering in the saloon, and the Everett's and their supporters were taking cover behind a building across the street. Cherokee Bob was drinking in the saloon and bragging about that he had gotten away with stealing one of the Everett's horses. The King boys, who were loyal to the Tuts, were also holed up in the saloon. And just so y'all know, this was all across the street where that field is there. That's what was there then. Now, before Mooney even got a chance to finish with the newly deputized citizens, a gunfight erupted that lasted the entire afternoon. Even after all the ammunition was exhausted, the two factions continued to fight using sticks, bricks, rocks, knives, and anything else that could harm someone. So this is what this skit is going to do. boys need to come on out here. We know Cherokee Bob is in there. He stole our horse. He was proven innocent. We ain't coming out and we ain't alone neither. We got the King boys here with us. You Everett's are outnumbered. If you want to fight, you'll have to come in the saloon. You don't want us to come in there. We know you ain't got no weapons. The Sheriff Mooney done took them all. Come on in, Everett, unless you're scared. Let's get him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sim. I ain't scared. <laughs> <laughs> Sim, you gotta get out of here. The kings are hightailing it back to Sarasota County. Maybe this feud can finally end. The Berry House was built by uh, James H. Berry, but he did not grow up or live in Yelmel. He was uh, born in Washington County, Virginia. Hmm. And in 1824, he was the third child of eight children, and in 1851, he moved to Yelville and he started the J.P. Mercantile, which is now the Layton Building over on the square. But when he moved here in 1851, Yelville didn't look like it does now. Yelville is actually more this direction, and where the uh, Dozier Tax uh, building is now is where the old courthouse used to be and then most of Yelville's buildings were over to that side not over here but J.H. Berry after he moved here he lived here about uh, two years and then in 1853 
he built this house. But actually, James Berry didn't build this house. He hired people to build it. And then he also included slave labor. Because see, in 1853, slavery was still legal in the state of Arkansas because guess what hadn't started yet? Civil War. But in 1861, the war did start. And when it did, the Berry House and there was one other house managed to escape being burned to the ground. And here's why. The federal troops, known as Union soldiers, the Confederate troops would take charge of the Berry House as their headquarters off and on. And even though there weren't any major battles from the Civil War fought in Yelville, there were still a lot of skirmishes that went on, conflicts that went on. And so whether you had a major battle or not, you still had wounded soldiers from the Union and wounded soldiers from the Confederacy. And they used this house, the top part of it, as a hospital and the bottom part of it as a horse stable. <laughs> now that's really, really interesting, but let me tell you something else that's even more interesting about this house. This house had a tunnel that was dug from the back of it to a cave where soldiers would be located after they'd been treated and could fight again. Because you know you don't just fight once when you're a soldier, you usually fight until you're dead or until the war is over. But anyway, they would go through the tunnel into the cave and then they would go out to Fort Adams, which was the, um, the location where they would begin to fight again. And it's just so amazing to think, it's just amazing to think that that part of history is here in our town. Now, most of the other buildings during that time, they were all burned to the ground, burned to the ground. But another interesting uh, aspect about this house is that the bricks that were made to um, build this house, uh, the, the mud for them came out of Crooked Creek. So there's so much history in this house. But um, that's enough, I think, of the backstory. And I'll go ahead and turn it over and let the, um, let the students give you their skit. It goes with the very end. soldier, William Buskett, that was shot at this spot, which was about a hundred yards from the Old Weiss Hotel that was up there. The Old Weiss Hotel was a, a, a well-used hotel during that time. This killing happened in the latter part of the Civil War. This horrible scene was described by Miss Martha Ann Taylor, the daughter of William Taylor that lived on Water Creek in the Prairies Township near Eros. The Taylor family were moving to D uh, Dallas County, Missouri, but first they wanted to stay a few days in Yellville to visit with their friends before they left. Martha told others that she witnessed the most unbelievable horrors and happenings of the Civil War. When they got, down, when they got to town, she saw a ditch in front of Mr. Berry's house, the house she just left, and there were four or five dead Union soldiers that were shoved into the big mud puddle and animals were eating on them. They, they then came upon this horrible scene and found Mr. William Buskett laying here and the pigs and the dogs were eating on his body. Through the graciousness of some good townspeople, Mrs. Darrell Wood, daughter of Matthew Adams and niece of John Adams, came along along with some other ladies and gave this poor soldier a burial. 
he was buried up behind the old Weiss Hotel over the cliff where there were a few of other, uh, it's a small cemetery and there's a few other buried there. April 28, 1957, at around 11 p.m., Marion County Sheriff Jack Pace, State Revenue Inspector Carl Burleson, Game Warden Dewey King, <laughs> April 28, 1947, at around 11 11 <laughs> 57 at around 11 p.m. Marion County Sheriff Jack Pace, State Revenue Inspector Carl Burleson, Game Warden Dewey King, and Deputy H.R. Jones were playing cards when the telephone rang. So they shot at us first, so I just shot back. This is Mary County Deputy Jones. 
Law enforcement officers search the surrounding woods for the criminals, who were apprehended five days later. These men were eventually tried and sentenced to prison. 